All right, so we covered the gluteal region anatomy in the previous lecture, and in this lecture we're going to cover the relevant clinical pearls. First, we'll start with intramuscular injections in the gluteal region, or IM injections. So the gluteal region is very common for IM injections because the gluteal muscles provide a substantial absorption area for the injection. So if you, you know, these muscles, these gluteal muscles, gluteus max, gluteus medius, minimus, they're very large muscles. So if you put an injection in one of these muscles, there's a large area for it to be absorbed into the vasculature of the muscle. So, but however, placement of an injection into the gluteal region, it must be carefully considered to avoid damaging the sciatic nerve. So you have the sciatic nerve coming in here, and you see the gluteus max comes over the top here. All these muscles come in proximity to the sciatic nerve. So IM injections in the gluteal region can really be given in two places, the superior lateral quadrant of the buttock and then the anterior lateral region of the thigh, and we'll go through each of those now. So the superior lateral quadrant of the buttock is the region superior to the line, an imaginary line extending from the pesis, which is about here, posterior, superior, iliac spine. Remember the asis is up here in the anterior portion. And then from that line extending down to the greater trochanter here. And, for, and roughly speaking, it's approximately su the superior border of the gluteus maximus muscle. So here's the gluteus maximus muscle. It comes in like that. So it would really be in this region here, above this imaginary line, above the superior border of the gluteus maximus. About in this region right here is where you could put an injection in. And as you can see, if you're up here, there's no way you're going to hit the sciatic nerve. If you're up this far, superior and laterally, you don't have to worry about it. Then for the anterior lateral region of the thigh, the needle can be placed in the tensor fascia lata muscle, which comes down from the, the asis up here in the front, anterior superior iliac spine. And the way you do this is you palpate the asis with your index finger. So we'll draw in an, you know, an index finger like this. And then you widely spread your fingers across, and then you have your middle finger extend across and palpate the bridge of the iliac crest here. And then that between your index finger and your middle finger, that's where you can safely put an injection in. So it would be this border and this border here. So anywhere in this region here is where you can safely put an IM injection in. Piriformis syndrome, this happens when the sciatic nerve becomes compressed or irritated by the piriformis muscle. So you can see where the sciatic nerve is in close approximation to the piriformis muscle here when it exits the pelvis. And the causes of this can be a number of things. The piriformis muscle shortens or it experiences spasms as a result of overuse or injury. So this muscle gets inflamed or enlarged. It can compress and irritate the sciatic nerve. Examples are sports that require excessive use of the gluteal muscles, such as cycling, ice skating, rock climbing. They, they all put an individual at risk. In some people, the, the sciatic nerve actually pierces through the piriformis muscle, which may put them at risk. So if we draw a piriformis muscle out like this, so normally the sciatic nerve comes out below. So we'll do SN and then P here. In, in some people, what happens is, is that the, the sciatic nerve actually exits the pelvis by piercing directly through the, the piriformis muscles. So the sciatic nerve actually pierces through. So that puts these people at even more risk of piriformis syndrome because if the muscle gets irritated even slightly or, or uh, enlarged or inflamed, it can, it can really compress the nerve and cause a lot of problems. So the presentation is usually of the, they have gluteal pain that radiates down the buttock and into the leg. And often the way of pain is relieved is by walking with the foot pointing outward. So laterally or externally rotating the hip that actually loosens up the piriformis muscle, thus relieving compression of the nerve. This is also known as wallet sciatica because this, the symptoms are similar to sciatica. Sciatica is where, you know, typically caused by a, a lumbar disc herniation where you have that shooting pain from your back and then it shoots down the back of your leg because it's, going, it's being, being carried by the sciatic nerve. Now this is called wallet sciatica because the, the pain can be exacerbated theoretically by a large wallet in your back pants pocket, which would be you know, right here, so the large wall compresses on this region here and then causes that shooting pain down the back of the leg. So physical exam, you can have tenderness over the sciatic notch area, so in this region here, which makes sense, that's where the piriformis is. Stretching the irritated piriformis can further the sciatic compression. So you do these two tests, there's the Faber test and the FAIR test. Faber stands for flexion, abduction, and an external rotation of the hips, so you do all three of these motions at the same time, so you have them flex it, abduct it out, and then externally rotate it. That'll further the compression on the sciatic nerve by stretching out the piriformis. And then the fair test does the same thing, where you flex the hip, and you adduct and internally rotate it. That can also exacerbate the pain. Diagnosis, you got to rule out spine and other nerve pathology via an EMG, a CT scan, or an MRI. So you want to look at the spine, make sure there's nothing going on in the spine, because 
sciatica in most people is is very is a very common uh, disorder you know where you have lumbar disc herniations or lumbar uh, path- spine pathology that can lead to uh, sciatic type pain where it radiates down from the back to the buttocks and then to the leg so you always want to rule that out you want to, an EMG especially will tell you uh, where along the nerve the problem is and then obviously CT and MRI will give you a good look at the bones and discs and ligament structures in the spine and the hips and then treatment you can give NSAIDs for pain relief you can do physical therapy you can put an anesthetic injection here to kind of calm things down or if it's really bad you can do surgery so superior gluteal nerve injury. Injury to this nerve results in denervation of the gluteus medius and minimus muscles, and this can result in instability in the gluteal region because these two muscles are responsible for stabilizing the hips while someone is walking during a normal gait. And so if these muscles are denervated, then it leads to something called Trendelenburg gait. So first for the normal gait, we'll talk about the function of gluteus medius and gluteus minimus since these are the two muscles that are denervated in a superior gluteal nerve injury. So here's gluteus medius, the more superficial. Here's gluteus minimus. Remember, gluteus medius connects here. Here's the distal portion. They both insert under this greater trochanter to help with abduction. The other thing they do, though, is during normal gait, so we have a posterior view here of the bony pelvis with you know, both hip joints shown here. And so when one person lifts one leg off the ground, so when you walk, you lift one leg off, and then you plant it, and then you lift the other one off, and so on. So when you lift one leg off the ground to stand on the contralateral foot, the gluteus medius and minimus actually contract to prevent tipping of the pelvis to the side of the leg lift off the ground. So if you lift, so here we'll, we'll, you know, we have the right side here, and so we'll show the right side as well on here. So these muscles right here, so when this person plants on this foot, so when they are lift this left leg off the ground, these gluteus medius and uh, minimus muscles are going to contract, they're going to contract, and they're going to pull this way. And what that does is, is it actually keeps the pelvis level like this. So we've drawn a red line in here. So when this, even though this left leg is off the ground, the right gluteus medius and minimus are contracting to pull the pelvis upright. Otherwise, the pelvis would actually sag down this way, and that's what happens during Trendelenburg gait, and we'll show that on the next slide. So in a normal person, when they stand on, the, on this right leg, the right side gluteus medius and minimus, you know, they're contracting, they're contracting like this. They're, so you notice they're contracting, you know, they're going to pull the pelvis this way, pull it up this way and to help keep it level, because otherwise it would just fall this way. So in a patient with a superior gluteal nerve injury, they develop Trendelenburg gait, which is when the patient puts all their weight on the right side. So this is the right side, posterior view, posterior view here, right side here. So if they put all their weight on this right side, this is normal right here. This would be if the gluteus medius and minimus were fully functional or the nerve was intact, the pelvis would be kept in the same level position. But what happens here is, is that as we've shown a, drawn another line in here, is that the pelvis tilts because there's no, so normally these would contract and pull the pelvis back this way to where it's level. But since this is de-innervated, you've lost that contraction, you've lost that counterbalance, it's almost like a counterbalancing force to gravity because gravity is pushing down this way, you know, the force of gravity, and then you need some kind of force to pull that pelvis back up, and that's what's provided by this gluteus medius and gluteus minimus muscles. So the opposite or the contralateral side is going to be is going to droop or you know lag downward so it's always the contralateral side so if the superior gluteal nerve on the right side is affected as we've shown here in this case the left side the pelvis is going to tip to the left side if it were the opposite where the left superior gluteal nerve was impacted or injured then the right side of the pelvis would dip down to the right side now since this pelvis tilts to the unaffected side, the left side in this case, to compensate while the patient walks, they're actually going to lean toward the weight-bearing side. So the, the whole, you know, torso or uh, thorax and abdomen, they're going to lean this side. So you're going to notice them kind of, when they walk, they're going to have this sagging pelvis like this, and but then they're going to lean this way to kind of balance it out. They're going to kind of use the rest of their body to pull this pelvis back into place. And the reason they do that is to allow for adequate room for the foot to actually clear the ground as it swings forward. So it's called a waddling or a gluteal gait because, you know, this pelvis is sagging. And so you need room for when you're taking this foot off the ground for it to swing forward. And so to give themselves room, that's where they'll lean off to the affected side. 
The other thing to be aware of is is that you know in addition to keeping the, the pelvis level during walking, they're also going to have weak a- abduction because these are uh, major abductors of the of the hip joint. So you know these muscles contract, they contract, they're going to pull out this way, and so superior gluteal nerve, you also have very weak abduction of the hip. All right, and that closes up our discussion of the gluteal region clinical pearls.